what's this? No. It's a book about pirates with a treasure map. No, I don't think so. I wish that I had seen through all your lies. Oh, start from the beginning, not the middle. And so I decided to pick up my pen to relate the most disturbing episode of my life thus far. It all began early one morning in 1898, when Sherlock Holmes invited me to accompany him on a visit to the Marquis of Conningham. Watson, my dear fellow. We can now go and inform the Marquis that we have found the Samoan necklace, and very much faster than Inspector Baines, too, which pleases me. Have you really solved the theft, Holmes? And so quickly? I have indeed, Watson. And believe me, it was completely unnecessary to spread out all over London, as our friend Baines thought was best. He likes to boast that his methods are equal to mine, but once again the outcome has contradicted him. After all these years of accompanying you upon your investigations, I thought that by now I should be reasonably capable of following your train of thought. But in this particular case, I must admit that I don't understand anything at all. Ah, you see, but you do not observe, Watson. There lies the difference. It is a matter of course. A matter of course? In the middle of the night, when everyone is fast asleep, the service bell within that room rings out and alerts the servants. They dress quickly and come running. But the door is locked and there is a strong smell of burning from within. A few seconds later, the master of the house himself, the robbed marchioness's husband, the Marquis of Conningham, arrives and unlocks the door using the sole key. A fire has started inside the room, but they have managed to arrive in time to put it out. It is at that moment that the Marquis realises that the famous Samoan necklace, which had been safe within its glass cabinet only a few hours earlier, has now disappeared. In order to explain, let us confirm my theory before the arrival of Inspector Baines. This window was cut with a diamond, a clean, discreet piece of work. This is where the necklace was. See how tiny the hole is, and not one fingerprint upon the window. All the windows are locked. They've not been forced. A mark, undoubtedly, made by a diamond. Someone tried to cut the glass, but he was interrupted. Therefore, the thief tried to escape through the window, but he was interrupted. I need something.
Let us examine the crumpled scores that have fallen off the piano. These sooty prints were left by a tiny hand. I don't understand why these music scores are covered with soot. Candle. It must have fallen from the chandelier. Not very well kept, this aquarium. I can see a dead fish floating on the surface. Footprints! You are not going to get on your knees to examine them. There is no need. It is soot. The servants must have trodden in it while they were putting out the fire. Strange. There are some objects here that have been knocked over. The fire started here, just beneath the bell pull. Whoever pulled the cord would have had his feet in the fire, unless it was pulled before the fire started. When the servants arrived at the door, having been alerted by the bell, they saw evidence of the theft and the fire, but they didn't see the thief. This door is very hard to force. The Marquis is the only person to have the key. The thief could not get out through here until eventually when the door was opened by the servants. This draft screen makes an ideal hiding place. As the theft was committed at night, I conclude that the thief hid himself behind the draft screen and waited until he was alone in the room. These documents are not very interesting, even though they're addressed to the Minister of Maritime Affairs. The Marquis himself! The chest wasn't opened. The necklace wasn't in it. What do you think, Holmes? Let us search the room before the police get here. We might throw some light onto all this. Heading towards his chosen escape route, probably the window, the thief knocked over the stool, which then caught fire. But why didn't he try to put the fire out at once? All the windows are locked. 
They've not been forced. Strange, there aren't any prints. Yet I'm sure that the thief hid here. Ah, Mr. Holmes, you're already here. Good morning, Inspector. You've arrived just in time. <laughs> Scotland Yard arrives like the cavalry, always in the nick of time. Ah, but I know that satisfied expression, Mr. Holmes. Have you already solved the case? It's possible. We have retraced the thief's rather unusual footsteps. He is a true acrobat. But what I cannot understand is that when the servants entered the room, there was no one to be seen. An acrobat, perhaps, but an invisible one? <laughs> I do not think so. The only explanation is that the thief escaped before the servants arrived. I don't know how, but there is no other way. Half a point for the doctor, nil for the inspector. I am pleased to see that you find the situation amusing, Mr. Holmes. Very well, then. Explain. Dr. Watson was correct when he mentioned acrobatics, but he is mistaken about the nature of the acrobat. As for you, Baines, you're quite incorrect, as the thief was in the room when the servants entered. Explain, for heaven's sake, Mr. Holmes. Watson, how could a thief be missed in the middle of eight men? I don't know. Because he is very small? Stop teasing us, Holmes. Exactly. Because he is small. Small and remarkably agile. You're thinking of a monkey? And a trained monkey at that, without a doubt, a Leontopicathus rosalia from Central America. The animal had been hidden inside the room for several hours, calmly awaiting the signal from his master. Once night had fallen and the room was empty, a high-frequency whistle alerted the monkey that it was time to begin the procedure for which he had been trained. The monkey emerged from his hiding place and used the point of a diamond to open the glass cabinet and steal the necklace. He headed across to the window by the chimney, but knocked over the stool, which in turn knocked aside the fire guard and started the fire. The frightened monkey jumped from the chimney by swinging from the bell pool, thus alerting the house servants. He then went to the window and began to use his diamond to cut a hole, but was interrupted by the staff trying to gain entry via the door, and he panicked again. He ran across the piano, scattering the music scores onto the floor, before hiding inside the chandelier, knocking over a candle. Finally, the servants and the Marquis entered the room, leaving the door open while they put out the fire. It was during the confusion that our agile little thief made his escape through the doorway. As simple as that. A brilliant explanation! Bravo, Holmes! And the necklace? I can see it from here, my friends. It's right in front of us. We have searched the room from top to bottom, Holmes. How were we unable to find it? because we paid insufficient attention to the only victim of this affair. What victim? No one is dead? Yes, Watson. A poor goldfish, whose destiny was to die, crushed by one of the most precious necklaces in England. The aquarium is just beneath the chandelier. I understand. The little monkey had likely hung the necklace around its neck and lost it when he leapt from the chandelier. The jewels fell into the aquarium, where they remain now. Marquis, here is your necklace, intact, just a little wet. Mr. Holmes! This brilliant demonstration does credit to your reputation. Thank you so much, Marquis. Do you wish to verify the authenticity of your jewel? No, I recognize it. I have spent many hours admiring it, you know. Good. I will return it to its box and... Inspector! A bank has just been held up! You must follow me at once! Orders of Scotland Yard! What times! Sirs, duty calls. My regards, Marquis. And well done again, Mr. Holmes. There, the necklace is in its box. We've lost enough time here. Let's go home, Watson. 
Ah, very well, as you wish. A good day to you, Marquis. With pleasure, gentlemen. And once again, thank you. <laughs>